What's the boss up to? He's telling the boys about the engine oiling system, Frank. The oiling system? For the love of Mike, hardly anything goes wrong with that system. You're right, my friend, but remember, while that system is just about foolproof, it's still a good idea to know how it works. Then you won't be stumped if an unusual oil job pops up. Why don't you go over and listen to what Barney's got to say? Well, okay, but not because I need to. I know that oiling system. And as we go through the engine oiling system, don't be afraid to sound off if you've got any questions. Most of you know how oil gets around, but there may be different opinions. So let's follow the oil through to see if we're all thinking together. The floating oil strainer in the oil pan is the front door of the system. When the engine runs, oil is drawn through the strainer. But what do you suppose keeps it floating? Why, it's that air chamber in the top. That's right, Frank. And it floats so only the clean oil immediately below the foam will be taken in. Yeah, and that screen on which the oil wipes its feet is mounted so it's drawn in if it should clog. That way, oil always gets to the bearings. Right, Tech. Now these two stops keep the strainer from rising or falling too far. If you ever check this installation, see that the stops aren't bent. And see that the strainer doesn't bind against the oil pan. Just line up the elbow with this right-hand cap screw on the number four main bearing. Oh, that strainer might pull in air if it sticks up, right? Yes, Red. Air leaks cause a momentary drop of pressure, and your oil pump might lose its prime. Now, a rotor-type pump driven by a gear on the camshaft pumps oil into a crossover tube in the pan. That pump's got big muscles, fellas. It pushes oil under pressure at the rate of five gallons a minute when the car travels 60 miles an hour. Yes, the main reason for pressure is to carry away heat generated by moving parts. But uh, getting back to the crossover tube, the oil goes past the pressure relief valve into the main oil gallery running the length of the block to feed the whole oiling system. Oil fills the whole system, including the filter, which gets its oil from the gallery. Wait a minute, Barney. Give me the lowdown on how the relief valve does its job. Well, Frank, the relief valve is essentially a plunger working against a spring. As the pump builds up pressure, it overcomes the spring and the plunger starts to unseat. As the plunger moves back, it partially uncovers the first port. Excess oil passes through this port back into the pan. At the same time, the filter outlet is partially uncovered. That lets oil from the filter flow around the radial groove and into the first port. The filter now can go to work. But what's that second port for, Barney? Well, Red, as oil pressure goes higher, the plunger opens farther. This lets more oil empty through the first port and channels all filtered oil through the second port. That's how the relief valve provides uniform pressure. And notice the drilled holes in the plunger. They are escape holes for any oil that might get behind the plunger and keep it from opening. Right, Tech. Now, beyond the relief valve is the main oil gallery. From it are four takeoffs to the camshaft bearings. Branching from these takeoffs are four vertical passages to the main bearings. And then oil spills on the connecting rod bearing. <laughs> and you're the guy who didn't want to hear about the oiling system. <laughs> Better give him the pitch, Barney. Well, Frank, spill isn't quite the word. The crankshaft has drilled oil ways that lead from main bearing journals to connecting rod journals. The holes in the main journals line up with grooves in the main bearing shelves. These oilways direct a continuous stream of oil under pressure to the main and connecting rod bearings. Hmm. Then I suppose the valves and pistons get their oil from the main bearings too. That's right, Frank. Each connecting rod has a small hole which lines up with the connecting rod oilway on every intake and power stroke. And through this hole, oil sprays the cylinder walls, lubricating the pistons, rings, and pins. The oil mist, created by the rotating crankshaft, lubricates cam lobes, the oil pump drive gear, and the tappet faces. 
Besides this, oil collects in little reservoirs above the tappet guides, drains into the guides, and oils the tappets. Say, hey, Barney, you're not going to forget about the timing chain and sprockets. Oh, no. They get oil from the front camshaft bearing. The oil squirts through a small tube in the timing chain case as it lines up with a hole in the camshaft each time the camshaft revolves. And the camshaft thrust plate is lubricated through a hole in the front camshaft bearing. Why does the thrust plate need lubrication, Barney? Well, because of the angular gear driving the oil pump, the camshaft tries to move forward. The thrust plate limits this camshaft travel. Due to the load on it, it needs to be lubricated. Cold oil, incidentally, gets stiff. The colder the oil, the greater the load on the gears, which increases the thrust. That's one reason why you should never race a cold engine. The other end of the camshaft rides in a bored hole closed by an expansion plug. Oil that gets between the shaft and plug drains out through a small passage. And to wind it up, fellas, all the oil from the engine eventually drains back to the pan. Then it's pumped back through the system again and again. You can see the importance of keeping oil passages open, the relief valve working properly, and the oil filter element clean. With a clean element, the dirt is filtered out of the oil. But don't think it's like straining soup. If the right elements used, abrasives you can't even see are filtered out. What effect can a clogged bypass filter have on oil pressure? None at all, Frank. That's because the filter circuit is a bypass off the main oil gallery. Say, some mechanics can tell when the filter's clogged by feeling it. If it's hot, it's working. If it's cold, it's clogged. Yes, but remember, in cold weather, it takes extra time to heat the oil enough to offset cool air surrounding the filter. And in warm weather, the filter absorbs heat through radiation. You'd better feel a couple of new filters you've installed. With practice, you can tell the difference between a clogged filter and one that's okay. Well, the bypass system's clear, but what about the full flow? Why, in the full flow system, Red, oil goes through the filter before it goes to the main oil gallery. Oil enters the relief valve, which opens off a short vertical passage in the block. Then it takes a path out through the side of the block, just above the relief valve bore, which leads to the full flow filter. After circulating through the element, the oil enters the main oil gallery for engine distribution. Yeah, but when the engine starts, a small amount of oil goes through a drilled hole in the relief valve and into an idle pressure gallery. This idle gallery empties in the main gallery, so oil gets down to the bearings fast, while the main oil supply first gets a bath in the filter. Right, Tech. Now, another thing to remember is that when an owner reports a gradual reduction of about 15 pounds in his normal operating oil pressure, it means a new element's needed. But be sure you use a Mopar element, because it's especially engineered for this system, and it'll do a more efficient job than any substitute element. Both bypass and full flow systems are covered in this reference book, fellas, so give it a once over later. Swell, Tech. It'll help. Okay. And it'll help if someone turns this record over. Then we can talk about a little troubleshooting on engine oiling. Okay, Barney. How would you troubleshoot low oil pressure in the bypass system? Well, you fellas know how oil travels through the block. What do you suppose could cause low oil pressure? That depends on whether you're checking for low pressure at idle or at higher speed. Now, low oil pressure at higher speed could be due to a relief valve stuck open, an oil or an air leak somewhere. Or maybe a plugged oil passage. But this wouldn't show on the gauge. That's right. But a plugged passage may cause low pressure beyond the restriction and starve a bearing. Say, a worn oil pump could cause low pressure, too. Yeah. But that pump rarely gives any trouble. Anyway, how come you guys left out the oil gauge? The gauge? Yes, Frank, with a low oil pressure condition, that's a good place to begin. It might just be a faulty gauge. Boy, would your face be red if you tore an engine apart and found only the gauge was wrong. And here's something to remember. That gauge fitting in the block has a 32nd inch hole which damps out small variations in oil pressure so they won't show up on the gauge in the form of a vibrating needle. That's right. So get a gauge you know is accurate. Hook it up with T's into the same oil gauge line. 
Start the engine and compare the reading. What if the gauge was okay and we still had low pressure? Well, if pressure were low at any speed except idle, I'd look at the relief valve. Frank's right. The relief valve never operates at low idle rate. So if pressure's low at a higher speed, put in a new spring of the same type. Then check the pressure. How about a heavier spring? No, sir, Reed. If you suspect a spring, try a new one. But be sure it's the same color. If you still have low pressure, you'll never fix it by adding a heavier spring. And for Pete's sake, fellas, don't ever put ball bearings or washers behind that spring. See what I mean? Tech's right. Putting anything there is like using a heavier spring. Chances are you'll have to look further for the real cause of low pressure. Well, where would you look? Tech claims we don't have much pump trouble. Who's worrying about pump trouble? We're still talking about the relief valve as a possible cause of low oil pressure. Yes, you see, Frank, foreign matter might work into the relief valve and stick it open or shut. So, look the plunger over for scratches. Yeah, and sometimes the plunger or bore wears and makes a click-click noise at a certain speed. Gun the engine up to that speed and back off the oil pressure relief nut. If the clicking stops, there's your trouble. And I'd try another relief valve. I see. And I suppose leaks in the tube connections, strainer, and crossover could affect oil at higher pressure speeds. There are possibilities, Red, and so are pump clearances. Yeah, but the age of the car and its mechanical condition will tell you what to check first. If you suspect the pump, Barney will give you the story. Well, there's one pump check I want to hammer home. That's the rotor end clearance, which is very critical to oil pressure. So when the pump's out, use a straight edge and feeler gauge to check this clearance. If it's more than four thousandths, that could cause low oil pressure at speeds above idle. Yeah, and the pump cover has got no use for scratches, grooves, or warpage. It's got to be flat inside of one one thousandth. Right. All specifications for pump clearances, pump removal, and installation are explained in this reference book. If a pump doesn't meet these specifications, replace it. Now that takes care of causes of low oil pressure at speeds above idle. Yeah, but what about low pressure at idle? Well, Frank, the importance of high oil pressure at idle has really been overstressed. Actually, any oil pressure at idle is okay if pressure goes up to normal at 30 miles an hour. Sure, Frank. All you need at idle speeds is a small flow of oil. And if the gauge shows some pressure, why worry? You'll know that oil's getting to the bearings. Tech's right. Another point is that bearing load and heat are low at idle, so you don't need much oil pressure. Now, getting back to low oil pressure at higher speeds, Suppose the gauge, relief valve, outside lines and pump were okay. What would you do? Well, you'd have to drop the oil pan and check for internal leaks. Yes, and on an old engine, which has low oil pressure at higher speeds, sometimes you can hear bearing noise. It's generally a combination of worn main and connecting rod bearings. Ever get a case where there's worn bearings and no noise? Oh, yes. The camshaft bearings can wear enough to lower the oil pressure and still not be noisy. And that's where the bearing leak detector tank comes in. Yes, and here's how you use that tank. Remove the gauge line from the side of the block and screw in this tank hose fitting. Then you force oil through the system under pressure. If it pours like mad from some bearings, that's where you're losing your pressure. But if oil drips out at about two drops a second, you can be sure the flow of oil at that bearing is not great enough to cause low oil pressure. Yes, and one drop every three seconds is ideal. While making this check, turn the crankshaft slowly. Then you won't confuse an oil stream at a questionable bearing with an oil stream somewhere else. For example, you get a stream when the squirt hole in the connecting rod lines up with a crankshaft oil wave. And you get a stream when the hole in the front cam bearing lines up with a hole in the block. Barney, is there anything else to keep in mind about bearings? Well, when bearings fail, it's usually because they don't get oil. So, find out why. That means checking the passages in the system to see that they're all delivering oil. 
To do this, remove the connecting rod bearing caps one at a time. If oil flows, the passages to the main and connecting rod bearings are all right. By the way, inspecting the oiling system while fitting bearings is good insurance against early failure and customer comebacks. Don't shut your eyes to another reason for low oil pressure. The lighter the oil, the more it thins out when the engine gets hot. And don't let me catch you using anything but the oil recommended for the climate in which the car is going to be driven. Here's another point about the oiling system. Clean oil is important for long engine life. Yeah. Nobody worries about a little boy's hands when they get dirty until the little boy gets sick. And a lot of car owners don't worry about dirty engine oil until their engines get sick. Then, boy, do they howl. Right. So change those filters when necessary. Every 8,000 miles for sealed container and replaceable element types. Every 5,000 miles for full flow filters. And always tighten filter connections and drain plugs snugly. Then run the engine at a fast idle for 10 minutes while you check for oil leaks. Incidentally, it's a good idea to be sure the air cleaner and breather cap on the oil filler tube are regularly cleaned and properly oiled. But confidentially, Barney, isn't the engine's oiling system practically trouble-free? Yes, Frank. It's designed to get the right amount of oil to the right place at the right time. But it's up to us to see that it keeps doing just that. Barney's right, fellas, because an efficient oiling system is the best life insurance an engine can have. When you put it that way, Tech, I can see why it's so important to know the system inside out. You said it, Frank. Because knowing the system from beginning to end will help you put your finger on any engine oiling problem in a hurry. Mm -hmm.